once in a while the Lord prompts somebody's spirit to share. Sometimes that happens from a, a third person statement where they will talk and exhort somebody uh, with words that are from the Lord. And sometimes that will happen in a first person statement where there's talking as though from God directly in a, in a, in a first person conversational sort of way. That's what Rod had today. Uh, I'm semi tempted to uh, change what I was going to do today. The, uh, the idea that you have the opportunity to sit with your Creator, talk to your Creator, the God of the universe, and spend one on one time with you, with me. It's crazy in my mind. It's trying to get time with the principal at my high school. I had to schedule it ahead weeks in advance. If you want to talk to the President of the United States, probably never going to happen. You can sit and talk with the creator of the universe. Well, it seems like all we need to say today. I'm not, because I spent a bunch of time on this, but it seems like uh, all we really need to remember. You can sit with your creator that loves you, wants to be with you. What an amazing thing. I was at Costco a couple of weeks ago. I go there every so often. I used to go there with Jerry. He, he, uh, it's one of his favorite places to go for lunch. <laughs> yeah. Go down and have a hot dog and a soda. So I have fond memories of Costco. They're getting less fond because the lines at Costco just keep getting longer and longer, but, uh, uh, but it's still fun to remember that. But I was down there... Costco a couple of weeks ago, and there periodically, and occasionally I get this one checkout person, clerk, whatever they're called, uh, and I'll come up and my stack of stuff will be there, and, and I'll, inevitably I'll say, hey, how, how are you doing? And this one particular person, and if you've been to the South Center Costco, you might have had this happen, his answer is always the same. How, I say, how are you doing? Blessed. Every time. That's what he says. And, and, and because usually the lines are 15 people long, I'll hear that answer 15 times before I get there. Hey, how's your day? I'm blessed. How are you doing? Blessed, 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 blessed. So I asked him one time. Not the last time. It was the time before, I think. Why are you so blessed? He said, I don't know. I'm just blessed. I wanted to ask more, but it was Costco. And it didn't feel appropriate for me to pry into it any further what he meant by blessed. But what I was leaving there, I was walking out to my car, and on one of the bumpers was a sticker. Bumper sticker said, too blessed to stress. And I, I just wondered if it's his car. I don't know. I don't know. But... Uh, You've seen bumper stickers that talk about being blessed. Now, the title of this sermon is Blessed. It's, it's not what it used to be. I want you to remember the title of this sermon because it actually is not what it used to be. But when you're out and about, you see bumper stickers talk about blessed. And I want to start off by saying that this sermon is not in any way about money. Because when we talk about and think about bless, oftentimes in our modern, particularly Western American mentality, it has to do with money. The sermon is not about money. But I'm going to ask you a question about money. If, and you have to say, take one or the other, you could have a box that it, whenever you open it up, it had all the money you would need. So it's endless money. You could have this box or not. What would you do? Did you take the box? I should have given my front end warning not to answer too loudly or quickly. Because I, I, I would just remind you that Scripture has some things to say about having too much money. It has something to say about if, if I have too much, how my attitude towards God might change. Now, why do I ask that? When the sermon's not about money, I just needed something to introduce this whole sermon with, and I thought I'd start with that question, because I think it's an interesting question. Would you take it? Because almost all of us would immediately, absolutely, 
give me a box of endless money. Until we stop and go, well, actually, Scripture cautions us about that. We can think of all kinds of great things we might do, but I know a lot of people that have a lot of money that don't do those things. But this sermon's not about money. It's about blessed. And on our cars, you'll often see different stickers that say how blessed people are, that they want to express that they're blessed. This one I thought was an interesting one. It says blessed there, some little flowers on it. And then it says across the top, shop with all in. All in on shopping. Blessed. We'll talk about that some other week. Not today, because this sermon's not about money. It's about being blessed. I did see this bumper sticker. God bless the whole world, no exceptions. Yeah, when I saw that, you know, at first it's just sort of like that question about money. Would you take it? Yes. Do we want God to bless the whole world with no exceptions? Oh, boy, wouldn't that be great? And then I thought about what's all over this world and thought, oh, that'd be a bad thing, wouldn't it? God just unequivocally blessed everything that mankind was doing. We'd be in serious trouble. God blesses where God blesses. There are lots of exceptions. Because we need to understand what does it actually mean to be blessed. If we understand what it means to be blessed, then we might have the ability to operate in whatever that function means to be blessed. We have scriptures, and, and some of them were read today, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We all remember that. The most famous sermon in history, this is how it starts. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't start off with a rousing goal. I don't get up in the morning and think I want to be more poor in spirit because I honestly don't understand it at the initial reading. Poor in spirit. And it continues on, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And again, I think, wow, what a rough start to a sermon. Starting off saying if you're poor in spirit and those who mourn, continues on after that, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Famous American general said, if that's the qualification for the earth, then I don't want it. It was a bold thing to say. And in reality, I don't really want the earth. But when Jesus is talking here, there's an implication that there's something desirable here. There's an implication that there's something going on that we are supposed to actually be struck with. Why would I want to be these things? It's not what our society values. It's not really what our humanity values. It's not what us as individuals usually want. I don't get up in the morning wishing to mourn more. And yet, blessed are the mourn, those who mourn. So I want to propose a little definition for blessed, and I think we need to split it out a little bit because it's used in different ways, so we're going to put it up here. There's blessed, and then there's a blessing. They're two separate things. Blessed, and then a blessing. Blessed is this, to have found approval from God. To be blessed means that you have found God's approval. You are sitting where God wants you to sit. You are doing and being what God wants you to do and be. That's what blessed is. To be where God wants you and to be how God wants you. To have found approval from God. A blessing is something received from God. Tangible, spiritual, experiential. So can a, a new car be a blessing? Yes. Does a new car mean you're blessed? No. There are lots of people with new cars. So having a new car doesn't mean you're blessed. It does mean that it can be a blessing. Because this is what James says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. So something that you have that's good is something from God if you are in relationship with God. Something received from God that's tangible, a car, something like that, uh, something that's spiritual, peace, joy, etc.
experiential time with a friend, time with your family. Yesterday I was at a wedding. My brothers, if you know my brother, uh, don't feel offended that you weren't there. It's kind of a weird three-step wedding thing that's going on. But he had to, for confusing reasons, they had needed to get married uh, this weekend. And, and so uh, it was at his wedding. He's 61, and it's the first time he's been married. It was an amazing experience and honor and privilege and all these sorts of things. And for me, it was a blessing because I love my brother. And I love seeing my brother happy, particularly after all these years. of his, He's always wished to be married at the right time, and it was the right time. That's an experiential blessing for me that I got to be there. So these things that come from God, that are positive pieces in our life, are blessings. They aren't necessarily saying that we are blessed. And I want that distinction because it's too easy, particularly in our society of wealth and prosperity, to feel blessed when you just have some blessings. Because if blessed means you're where God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do, and that your character is what God wants it to be, the presence of blessings can't be the signal. Because the signal isn't present for other people who are perhaps where God wants them to be but don't have those things. And I don't, if that's confusing, I have a, a, a brand new car. I actually got two brand new cars recently because one got ruined. And, uh, but th- the fact that I have a brand new car doesn't make me more blessed than you if you don't have a brand new car. I felt like it was right before God financially and situationally to get the new car, so I felt like it was something God gave me permission. But that doesn't mean that I am blessed more than a person who had to walk to church. I have a blessing that they don't have, but it doesn't mean that my relationship and position with God's better than theirs in any way. But what we also have to understand is these can be connected. They can be connected. And I want to show you, this is a, a verse that wasn't read today. It's a, it's a verse that I, I'm, I'm hesitant even to put it up because it starts off talking about tithing. And remember, this is not a sermon about money, nor is it a sermon about tithing. It's still the word of God. Malachi 3, 10 to 12, starts off saying, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, he's t- this is a letter. It's being written. It's a message written to Israel itself. It's not this isn't a letter to one person, hey, tithe, but it can still be to you or to me. But it says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. That tithe at that time that would have been crops. Because they would have been growing crops, and the requirement was to tithe so that there was food in God's house so that it could be shared with people who didn't have. So there might be food in my house. Now, well, look at this. He says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And I'll put it in sear and green. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing. See the word blessing? That there will not be room enough to store it. Now, I've got to pause here for a second in this sermon that's not about money and say that we've used this verse in certain circumstances, Christian spiritual circumstances, to say, look, if you just start giving, you won't have enough room in the bank to store your cash. Nonsense. Absolute Americanized nonsense. This is a statement to Israel who is doing it wrong. And we're not going to talk about this whole set of texts here, but God actually started off saying, you're robbing me. And if you would stop doing that, I would put you in the place where I want you to be. And your crops would be more than enough to take care of your needs. It's not saying you'd have more than you could ever possibly use and it would sit and rot in your bank accounts and sit and rot in your silos and that sort of stuff. That's not what this is about. But it is saying, test me in this and I'll show you how much I can do for you. See, look at this part. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe. He's making a promise. Two pieces here. So I'm going to change it just a little bit. I want you to say the blessed part in yellow, to have found approval from God. A blessing 
Something received from God, tangible, spiritual, or experiential. So we'll put it in the text. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. If you do what God says to do, then you're in God's will. You've been put in a place, you've put yourself in a place where you have God's approval. God said, do this. If you don't do it, you're not blessed. You're not under God's approval. You're doing your own thing. If you do do it, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, then the second half shows up. I will throw open. I took the knot out so it was in present and forward tense. I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there will not be enough room. It says blessing. Something experiential, something from God. What? He's going to throw open the floodgates for those crops of yours to feed their entire nation. If you just do what I said to do, you'll be blessed because you'll be where I want you to be. And if that's the case, then there will be this blessing that takes place. I'm going to say it again. This is not about money. This is not about money. Does it apply to money sometimes? Of course. Is it about money? No. We have to remember that the kind of wealth that the Western civilization has now is something that is unprecedented in human history. In the last 200 years, the United States by itself has produced so much wealth that it is something completely different than anything that any historical record can talk about or comment on. So we'll talk about money in another sermon, but this is not about money. Does it mean that God will take care of your needs? Absolutely. Does it mean that God will make you what the West considers wealthy? No. We'll talk later. Just keep that in mind. It's not about money. So we get back to this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed is a position before God, not a result. Blessed is not a result or an outcome. It's a position before God. The outcome are the blessings that God chooses, not you. The things that you will get are chosen by God, not by you. The position before God is determined by you, not by God. So to be blessed is to make a choice to be in the right place before God. And then the blessing, whatever those might be, are the things that God chooses to do in your life from him to you who's in the position to get them. Does that make sense? And I know that's kind of a trap question because who's going to raise their hand and say no? But the, if, if not, I'm going to ask you to work on it and ask me if, if you need help getting it because this matters a lot. We get blessing wrong and we get blessed wrong. When you say to somebody on the end of a text or a note, you say, God bless, what do you mean? And I'm not accusing anyone, because I say that at the end of my, I don't know how to end text, love you, it's great to talk to you, God bless. But occasionally I have to stop myself and go, "What, what do I mean by that? Am I actually saying, put yourself in a right position before God? Because that's accusational. So next time I send you a text, write back. What do you mean by that? (laughs) What we actually mean when we say God bless is may he take care of you and be kind to you and and do nice things for you and give you a good thing and your day go well and you sleep good tonight and get up in the morning and that sort of thing. That's what we mean when we say God bless, but it's not what it means to be blessed. What it means to be blessed is to be in a right place before God. These, we'll take the second halves off for a second, blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit isn't something that God gives you. It's a position he wants you to be in. Those who mourn, that's not something that God gives you. That's a position he wants you to be in. All of the Beatitudes are positions, right places before God. The term Jesus used, we're going to talk a little bit more about this next week. I'm not going to finish this part today. But what the word that Jesus was using, he was intentionally pulling in to reframe. Because the word had been become to be used as the elite, the successful, 
the top of the civilization. It was used to talk about the gods in the, kind of the Greek and Roman sense, that the, those who have elevated themselves above everything. He takes that term and repackages it in the most famous sermon he'll speak and says, no, <coughs> blessed is being in a right position before God at the bottom, not at the top. He's intentionally changing the perspective of the society and saying, no, it, we're not at all saying that blessed are those who live in the ivory towers and drive the fancy chariots. We're not talking about them. We're not talking about those who have risen above in some existential way. We're talking about those who are right here struggling through life, rightly positioned before God. This is what comes before verse 3. The Sermon on the Mount starts with two little introductory verses that matter a lot. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. If you had a children's Bible when you were a kid, and there was a picture, an illustration on the Sermon on the Mount page, you probably saw Jesus on this gently sloping hill with this massive crowd that he was speaking to. That isn't what this says. It's not what it says. It does say there was a gigantic crowd. And by implication, if there's a gigantic crowd, you've got people who came from their homes and from town and from the farms around to, because they were curious about Jesus. They had some interest. They had some thing they wanted. This guy sounds interesting. I'm going to go see. That's a little bit like church for the casual curiosity. Oh, I'm going to go see what's going on there. That's not a statement about any one of us. But church can become the place for the casual curiosity. And Jesus saw the Massive crowd with the casual curiosity, and he went away from them. And he went up on a mountainside and sat down. And those who really wanted to know came and sat with him, and he taught them. The ones who really wanted to know, not just the part of the show, not part of the big energy of the crowd. We all love the energy of the crowd. It's fun to go to a concert or a fair or something like that. There's a lot of energy and life to that. That's, it, it adds to our own spirit in a sense, not our true spirit, but we, it's very easy to do. Watch a Seahawks game. There, there's, there's spiritual energy there, and, and we all like to be a part of that. Christian stuff can be that, and Jesus will step away. And those who really want to know what he really has to say about what life's really about, will come to him and he'll teach them. That's where this Sermon on the Mount came from. He sits with those, his disciples, and he says to them, blessed are the poor in spirit. The right position before God is sitting at his feet saying, how do I live this life? If you want to be blessed, not blessings, I have a friend who has more blessings than I'll ever have. He's wealthy, influential, powerful, lots of friends, doesn't know Jesus from a hill of beans and doesn't want to. If you want to be blessed, you come to the feet of Jesus and you say, how do I live this life? And then he'll tell you, blessed are these things. And he'll leave it in your court to decide, do I want to do those things or do I not? So the question that I have, we're going to carry on. I'm going to flash to the next slide. It's, it's the first slide from next week. Well, probably the third slide. But the Psalm 1, we're not going to read it right now except the very beginning. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The, Psalm 1 is talking about what it takes to keep yourself in the position of in the right place with God. Sermon on the Mount does it in a different way. The Sermon on the Mount does it in a way of, 
when the condition of your heart gets to these places, these things will be true about you. These things will be the gifts from God. The blessings are the second lines of those first lines, which are, these are the things you need. I don't want to be meek, to be honest with you. But that's what God wants of my heart, for me to be in a right position before Him. I have to make the decision, do I want to be blessed by being in the right position before God? Am I going to seek that out with my time, with my energy, with my actions. And if I want to be blessed, then I'm going to come to Jesus and I'm going to say, is this how you want me to be? This is why I asked the question about the box with money. Man, if somebody set that box in front of me, the problems I could fix, the people I could help, the things I could do in the world with a box, I just keep pulling money out. There's two problems with that. It's not scriptural. Because scripture says, if I get too much, I'm going to forget that I need God. And if I start helping everybody, they're going to turn to me, not Jesus. It doesn't mean I don't want to help. It doesn't mean I'm not supposed to help. But it does mean this. I can't be the source of their help. I've got to steer them to Jesus. And if they think I've just got a box and it doesn't cost me, and it doesn't cost God anything, that's a problem. So if anybody ever asks you, do you want this box? Say, I do, but I'm not going to take it. Because I would not be blessed to have my resource come from a box, not from the King of Kings. If our desire is to be blessed, we've got to make a decision that everything Jesus says is exactly what I want to do. Amen? Amen. Amen.